All right, welcome back. Today is all about lights and cameras and rendering. Uh, you can see here we have this uh, Evo model, which I did not model myself. This is actually a fairly old model I from back in the days when I was in Blender. Um, and I'm sorry, I do not remember the name of the person who did this, but uh, they're fantastic and I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to light this car as the kind of in-class example. But first, I just want to cover generally how lights work. So I'm going to, I put the car on its own layer, I'm just going to hide it, and then I'm going to add a uh, polygon sphere. I'm going to move it up one unit so it is sitting on the ground. And I'm going to give it a basic uh, material. So I'm just going to right click, assign new material, and I'm going to choose a render man. Uh, I'll do a legacy Disney material. Okay, just a very basic, slightly shiny blue material. Uh, now, if I hit render man and just go to my IPR render, we can take a look at it. Uh, and this is the scene. By default, we have this very stark, starkly lit uh, scene. Uh, and that is what happens when you don't actually have any lights in the scene. Also, I'm going to hit three on the number pad to smooth out the. Uh, smooth out the render. Um, I'm going to quit that for a second and just check my render settings. So I'm going to choose for right now, just for the demo purposes. Actually, no, 540 is fine. Check my sampling, IPR samples, 64. Okay, yeah, that'll be fine. So by default, there is. I can actually delete the default light set. Uh, actually, no, I cannot. Never mind. Um, when there's no lights in the scene, it, it will default to this default light set. Now, the way RenderMan works with lights, we talked about adding the, the dome light, um, but I briefly mentioned environment daylight. So those are environmental lights that are, you know, the dome light is image based. Um, over here we have the mesh light, which I, I've also talked about where you can actually take geometry and make that emit light. But today is about this first uh, section, which is light. <laughs> You've got a few different options, uh, rectangular light, disk light, distant light, and sphere light. So sphere light is, is like a object. Um, AOV light I'm honestly not f that familiar with because I've not been in RenderMan that long. Um, and I've not uh, gone into it, and we won't need it anyway, so um, I would refer to the RenderMan website for uh, excellent tutorials on that. But these top three we can talk about. Um, the distant light you can think of as a sun. So this is a, it's a hard light, meaning the shadows that it casts will be hard. There won't be any kind of fall off on the shadows. Um, and the way that this light works is it doesn't the location doesn't matter okay it's not emitting from this point it's is only directional okay so it, it like the Sun the Sun is so big and so far away it's everything is lit evenly the same way I mean within reason I know that's strictly speaking not true not true if you zoom out really far but that's what this light is representing so if I go to IPR now and you see that renders, right? I'm going to uh, fit image to window. Whoops, other way around. Resize window to image. And also turn off my catalog. I don't need that right now. I'll check that. Okay. So there's my IPR render. Now, if I take my directional light and I rotate that around, you can see how the shadow moves. But it is a hard shadow. It's a hard edge here on the shadow. That's the directional light. You can see this feels like a direct sunlit scene. Um, you'll also, also notice we're getting some, some bounce light. Okay, The underside of this is lit, and that's the light that's bouncing off the, the scene and kind of lighting the underside there. That's why I have this ground plane. Uh, if I hide this ground plane, which is a key command that I never remember, there it is, and restart my IPR render, you can see the underside of that sphere is black because that light has nothing to bounce off of. Okay, that's why you want an environment for your models to show off. 
because uh, they have to exist in the world, and, and light is bouncing all around. It's it's a very important part of you know making things feel real. Now this feels like a planet, which is its own aesthetic. Um, but I'm going to show my uh, ground plane again. I'll restart the IPR render. So that is directional light. Um, I use directional lights f pretty seldom. You know, if you're if you are lighting a big outdoor scene, great. Yeah, they certainly have their uses. But for what we're going to do, we're going to do more studio style lighting. So we're not really going to use directional lights. So I'm going to delete that. Um, you'll see that the IPR render will update as I, you know, rotate the light. It'll also update if I change the intensity, but it won't update if I delete the light or if I add a light. In that case, I just have to re-click the IPR button and restart the render. And you can see when I do that, it's it's gone back to its default lighting setup. So the other two lights are very similar, but uh, there is one difference, uh, and that is the shape. One is a rectangular, one, one is a disc. So square or round, uh, how, how you choose depends on the use and what type of reflections you want, really. If you want a, a, a round, specular highlight, uh, disc light is the way to go. If you don't mind seeing the corners or if you want kind of this big softbox feel, go with a rectangular light. I use them both. Uh, if you are familiar with lighting, and before I move this around, if you are familiar with lighting uh, in 3D especially, you might be used to terms like point light and um, spotlight and area light. These are only area lights. And I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I believe the reason why RenderMan does not include a point light is because that's a physically inaccurate light. It's not possible for light to emit from one point. Um, even the sun, with how far away it is, it is slightly, you know, it has a size, um, and that's covered in the distance light anyway. But like a light bulb, a filament is not a single point in space. It, it, it is a object. It, it does have mass, and, and it occupies area. Um, that being said, okay, I have added a disk light here, and I will rotate this around. You can see as you add these lights, it, it's, it creates this widget with the RenderMan R shape and a very helpful arrow to tell you which way the light is pointing. This arrow will point where, where the light is facing, which is very helpful. You can see as I refresh my render, now we get this very lovely kind of soft light, um, softly lit scene. Um, I actually really like how this looks, even though it's super simple. Um, and we, yeah, we do have this soft kind of fall off on the shadow. Um, you know, one of the, the key things to look at as you're evaluating light is the shadows. Um, and if you want a harder light, what you need to do is you need to scale the, the source down. Okay, so as I select this light and maybe, oh, there we go, and scale it down. Whoops. I want to scale it in all directions. There we go. So as we scale that down, first of all, it gets darker because there's less area emitting light. Um, so I'm going to go over to my attribute editor, and we've got two sliders that we can use to affect the brightness of the light, okay, the intensity. So there's intensity and there's exposure. Uh, as you hover over them, it'll give you the tooltip. So intensity is a linear scale. So if you want to double the intensity of the light, you need to go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to, si uh, four to 8, excuse me, that's how math works, uh, 8 to 16, and so on. Exposure is a, uh, what do they call it, logarithmic inverse square. Uh, it's a more physically accurate way to think about light, or at least, I guess the way it describes it is artists comfortable with uh, photographic measurements would be more comfortable here. So the way exposure works is as you go up one increment, so one to two, you are doubling the intensity of light. So one to two is doubling the light, two to three is doubling the light, three to four is doubling the light. I tend to work in exposure. Um, it's a kind of more comfortable scale for me. Uh, so that's what uh, we can use here. Um, so I'm going to set the exposure to like, I don't know, four, see how that looks. Okay, now we're getting some light back in the scene. I'm going to go up a little bit more to six. 
Actually, I'm just going to go to 5. So I'm going to double the amount of light. Hit 5, hit return. Now we get more light. And now we can start to see the shadow. And when I scaled this light down, that shadow got a lot harder. Okay, so you can still get that kind of effect of a point light or of a spotlight with these uh, with these lights here, with the, the area lights. Now I can also scale this way up. Oops, make sure I select it in the viewport. Hit scale, go big. Okay, so if I scale this way up, you can see the intensity is obviously too bright. So I'll bring the exposure down to one. And now we have a super soft shadow. Okay. Size of the source affects the qual quality of the light. And by quality, I mean um, harder soft shadows, okay. which is a more you know, harder soft light. Um, you can also see with this material, we've got this circular reflection here. Okay. So we can see the source of the light. We can also see how the light falls off into the darkness. Um, now, I have a few other options here that I can I can use. I can change the color of the light. Okay, maybe I want this to be a red light. Or maybe just a slightly redder light. One thing to keep in mind as you're coloring lights is you're not just coloring... It's not just the white. You're not just going to turn white things that color. You're also going to... That light's going to interact with other colors. So if you cast a... If you cast a red light on a green object, you're going to make it turn brown and dark and, and, and muddy. Um, likewise, a uh, orange light on a blue object just gives you terrible results. Right? That's because they're complementary colors. They're opposite each other on the color wheel, you see. Okay, you can see this. Um, I'm going to keep it at white. It's, it's much more pleasing. Um, you also have enable temperature, which allows you to, to dial in a color temperature if you are familiar with that. Um, have at it. Uh, otherwise, you can just keep it off. That's fine. You're not going to need it. Uh, and then we have some options to refine this. So uh, emission focus, and again, these will have tool tips. Um, so this controls the spread of the light. Higher numbers will start focusing light towards the center, and thus narrowing the light spread. Okay, if you are familiar with uh, you know, film production lights, they have a focus knob on the back. That's what this is doing. So as I bring this up, you see that area of influence tightens up. Emission focus tint. Uh, so this will uh, tint the emission of the falloff region starting from the off angle direction of the light towards the center. So let's just uh, make it red. And now we can see the falloff in the center, the light is, I'll bring the focus down a little bit so we can see this more prominently. The light starts white, okay, it's normal color, and then as it falls off, it falls off to this uh, mission focus tint. I'm not sure of a situation where you would use that, but it's there. Uh, specular amount. So this is, uh, you could use the light with specular amount zero to act purely as a source of diffuse life, light for your scene objects and avoiding highlights. So if you just need to bring up a little the level of, of light in one area, but you don't want to see the reflection, you don't want to see the highlights created by that light, this is where you can adjust. So I can just take the specular amount down, and you can see that specular highlight went away on my object. It's still a specular material on that sphere, but this light is not casting any specular light. Okay, that's one of those things that you can do in 3D that you can't do in real life. You can't. I mean, you could do some polarizing filters, but it's, it's super tricky and not, not nearly as easy as just moving a slider. Um, likewise, we have a diffuse amount. So if you just want a light just to give you that specular highlight, you can, you can bring the diffuse light down. And now we just have that highlight. That's pretty cool. Um, intensity near distance. So near distance between the point being illuminated and the light at which the sample doesn't get brighter. So this will help you avoid hot spots um, when you put a light near a surface. So the way that light works in the physical world is as you move away from a light, as you double the distance away from a light, the intensity drops by a quarter. Okay, Which means if you move from two feet away from a light to four feet away from light, that light is a quarter as intense. 
It also works the other way. So if you move half the distance closer to the light, the light is four times brighter than it was. And if you're lighting a scene and that, that difference, so let's say you're lighting a, I don't know, a bus. All right, you put the light at the front of the bus and the middle of the bus is lit properly and it's, it's bright enough and it's probably fine towards the back end, but the front of the bus is really blown out. You can adjust this intensity near distance so that it won't blow out that front front part of the bus or you know whatever it is that you're lighting. We also have a cone angle. So this is kind of similar to focus. Um, as you can bring that down, you can kind of really narrow that. You can see, narrow that cone. So this is focus. You notice as you adjust the focus, it's still very soft around the edges. But cone angle is like you're bringing in an artificial, and this, Maya calls them flaps, like you're bringing in artificial barn doors or a cookie or, or something that would, um, cookie is a lighting term for a lighting control object, not a chocolate chip. Um, but so as you bring this cone angle in, then you, you can see that that light, it feels like there's an artificial disc that's covering the light, okay? And then you can also adjust the cone softness. So if I want to then soften it up a little bit, you certainly can. There's more of a stage feeling um, source of illumination. Okay, uh, and then that's really all we need to worry about. Enable shadows, so if you don't want this light to cast shadows, you can turn that off. You notice that if you do turn off cast shadows, it suddenly does not look real at all. It looks super fake and you can't tell what is happening. It doesn't look like that ball exists in space at all. It's just floating around in purgatory. I don't know. So shadows are, <laughs> are very good. Um, you can adjust the shadow color, the intensity. Um, we don't really need to worry about anything else though. Uh, yeah. We can turn on camera visibility. I don't know how well that's actually gonna work in this instance. But we can try it and see what happens. Yeah, it's not really not really showing up there. Um, so that's it for the controls for lights. The if I add in the uh, delete that one. Whoops. If I add in a uh, rectangular light, it works the exact same way. I've got the same controls. The only difference that you're really going to notice, whoops, is the highlight. Alright, I'll scale that up a little bit. And then I'll hit render and I'm probably not even sh shining on the sphere. Maybe I am, we'll see. There we go. Okay, so now we can see that now the specular highlight has corners. Um, but I've got the same, same controls here that I did with the disk.